Good morning, everybody. Um, quick show of hands. How many of you in the audience have been uh, part of an appraisal process, whether it's your business has been valued as a, or as an advisor, you've helped with uh, preparing a report or um, advising a client through that business valuation process? Good. So a couple people have been exposed. I'll try, uh, you know, to go over the methodologies fairly quickly and get into more of the, the planning aspects that could be uh, taken advantage of in a succession planning uh, context. Business valuation for succession planning. Thank you, Mario. Yeah, that would be helpful. Uh, so I, I can't start this without first having a shameless plug for Apple Growth Partners. Um, we are a, a regional accounting firm primarily. We focus primarily in tax and audit two offices, one in Cleveland, one in Akron. I head up our business valuation and litigation support department. We have seven full-time folks. That's all we do is appraisal of privately held companies for all kinds of different purposes. Um, so my presentation today is gonna focus on sort of the theoretical valuation world as opposed to um, where John and Mario might get into more of the uh, transactional uh, M&A uh, based uh, valuations. Uh, and as we all know, if, you, if you're familiar with appraisal, such as real estate appraisals, um, the value that can be derived under a theoretical valuation conclusion could be very different than what an actual transaction occurs at. And we can discuss some of the reasons why that, that there's a difference there. Um, Apple Growth provides valuation services for a range of different types of needs, including fair market value opinions for transactions, for ESOP opinions as well. Uh, estate and gift tax valuations, which I think will be something we highlight here today as a very useful succession planning uh, tool. Um, we also provide litigation support, whether it be lost profits, economic damages, shareholder disputes, um, and some transaction due diligence. All right, so for those of you that are familiar with valuation, know that there are really three approaches to valuing any privately held company. Um, the cost approach, the income approach, the market approach. Uh, the cost approach, much like it sounds, is basically looking at what the assets of the um, company are worth, and those are the fair market value of the assets, less its liabilities. What you have left over is typically um, the lowest value of the equity, we call that a floor value, because it doesn't typically address intangibles, uh, which oftentimes, hopefully, that's one of the largest assets of a business. Um, the income approach, like it sounds, uh, it looks at what's the income generating ability of the company and, um, and deriving a value based on that, based on the risk of the company. And then the market approach, much like it sounds, is looking to the market for transaction multiples to apply to a company in order to derive a value. Um, and so in the theoretical valuation world, we have these three approaches. And what we're attempting to do is recreate <coughs> what a hypothetical willing buyer and willing seller would pay for a privately held company. And that is, um, you know, it, it typically is a lower value than what a strategic buyer who's going to bring their own synergies to the table. So doing a valuation process or planning around a valuation process, if the idea of thought is to save estate taxes, if the idea of thought is to transfer the business to a friendly party, whether it be a family member or business uh, management team member, um, that might be one of the better routes to go just because you are going to achieve a goal at a lower value. Um, but within the cost approach, really where we look, where you'll find most valuation reports, um, if they cross your desk, um, presenting a value is uh, really the starting with the book value of the company, right? What are the, the accounting costs of the asset less the uh, carrying values of its liabilities for its net equity? And then appraiser will make adjustments from that because as we know, book value does not really measure the true value of a company or its assets due to depreciation and some other factors. 
Um, so the next challenge for, for, for us in the starting point is to figure out what the assets are really worth. Are the receivables really um, collectible? Do we need to take some sort of reserve against those? The inventory, is it slow moving? What, what is obsolete? And uh, these are, even if you intend to sell your business to a third party for potentially a much higher value, it's always very important to, to know what your balance sheet is worth. Because lots of times there's going to be working capital or other adjustments that go into um, ultimately negotiating the transaction price. So whether or not you want to go to market or you want to go through a valuation process, we almost always recommend going through a cost approach analysis so you understand what your true balance sheet is worth. The um, sort of on the next slide under the cost ap approach, um, one of the things I'll highlight here are the off balance sheet or contingent liabilities. And these are things, again, if you're going through a sales process or it's a valuation process, you want to spend time with your advisors, with your key management team, <laughs> to really figure out what your exposure is for any off balance sheet liabilities. You know, a big one we always see that gets caught up in transactions are um, some environmental concerns. Uh, you might have um, pension uh, funding issues, and, and those are obviously things that a buyer or an appraiser like myself, uh, putting our shoes in the, in our, ourselves in the shoes of a hypothetical buyer, are going to want to consider. So um, that, it's a useful exercise to go through that process. The, uh, the next approach is the income approach. And I would say this is the preferred methodology that business appraisers like to use. And I say that because um, it allows for probably the most amount of flexibility in understanding and projecting out what the future of a business looks like. And if you have a sophisticated business that's doing good management, planning, and projections, this is a very viable method. Lots of times you don't have management that helps or has thought about um, creating a projection into the future, so we can either help them or we look at some other methods. Um, I guess the, the tenet for those, the, those of you that aren't aware, um, in an income approach, and it really applies to all the approaches, is what an appraiser is looking to do is understand what's the true free cash flow of the business. What can an owner or a potential buyer take out of the business without harming the operations? So it's typically adding back non-cash um, expenses. It's taking out the future expected investments and capital expenditures and your change in working capital. And those are the types of things that get you to free cash flow. And we take that free cash flow, and whether we apply a multiple and a market approach, or we divide it by a cap rate, if you ever hear that term, those are just measures of risk, uh, expected rates of return. So appraisers have lots and lots of um, tools to help determine what those rates of return should be. I won't bore you with any of those right now, but if you are interested and care to know, I'm happy to discuss them. The, uh, so as I said, if the, on the next slide under income approach, the capitalization of earnings, if you have a, a management team that does not prepare projections, you're really stuck at looking at historical averages. And we like to look at a long-term average that covers um, an entire business cycle, if it's possible, we have lots of cyclical businesses in Northeast Ohio. And so on, from a, an appraisal perspective, we certainly want to take into account the good years and the bad years. Uh, obviously, if you're a business owner and you're trying to sell your business and you're at the peak of the market, you probably don't want to go back five or six or seven years and certainly don't want to look at 09 or 08 in your average. Uh, but don't be surprised if a, a valuation analyst does do that. Uh, so the capitalization of earnings is basically it's a truncated discounted cash flow. You're looking at one single period and capitalizing that cash flow as opposed to looking out four or five years and bringing those cash flows back to present value. The next slide of normalizing historical earnings. This is... Uh, Again, it's important whether you're taking your business to market, whether um, you're just valuing it for gift to uh, a next generation. 
these are all of the types of adjustments that a business appraiser is looking at to get to what is that true cash flow of the business. Um, the, probably the first adjustment most business appraisers make is looking at owner com or family compensation. Um, lots of times in a privately held company, family owned company, there are folks on the payroll that haven't been to work in years and they live in a different state. And so we certainly, if you want to capture the true value of the company, those are the types of expenses you would be adding back uh, as a hypothetical seller or buyer. The, uh, the other list that sort of um, falls into that category is owner perks. And uh, this could be a, a really long list. And depending on um, your client's sensitivity to IRS audit and things like that, these might be ones they don't come forward with. Um, but it's obviously in their best interest uh, if they're going to market to make sure you cover all these items. Uh, my, my favorite example of this is a manufacturing company I had. Um, this was in a litigation context. Not an Apple growth client, I just want to say that. <laughs> and uh, this was their manufacturing company. The owner, however, liked this particular restaurant and purchased a restaurant and remodeled it several million dollars. And um, about a million dollars of it showed up in his cost of goods sold in his manufacturing uh, business. So that was certainly an ad bag. So I've seen everything, including literally the kitchen sink in that example. Uh, the other items you're going to want to adjust for in the historical earnings are uh, non-recurring expenses, things that don't, um, you, you don't plan to see recurring, um, severance packages, litigation expenses for unusual litigation, um, those types of things. Also need to investigate all re related party payments. And a good example of this is rent payments to a captive real estate holding company. That's something that always needs to be examined when determining fair market value and certainly understanding what the value is in the transaction. If the buyer and seller are going to come to terms on a lease rate, you should be putting that lease rate into your valuation model. The, uh, really, the, the last methodology is the, the market, market uh, approach. And here, basically, what we're looking at is um, two, two, data, two sources of information. Publicly traded companies, what multiples are they selling at? That's not our preferred methodology. It's, for smaller, privately held companies, it's, it's harder to make a good comparison between that company and a billion dollar multinational uh, diversified company. But it is one of the recommended methods by the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, the other method that's probably more prevalent for smaller mid-market companies is the uh, private transaction method. And there are a number of uh, databases that we have access to and business appraisers have access to um, that are basically created by business brokers. So business brokers report actual completed transactions for 100% controlling interests. We have access to that information. We can search it by size, SIC code. Um, uh, keyword, there, it's, it's pretty uh, robust in the way you're able to search for these. So again, we're trying to find comparable transactions to determine what the market is pricing this industry at today. I'm going to skip over the, uh, the next couple slides in the interest of time, um, and I'm going to go to the enterprise value slide. Um, and, and for those of you that are advising your clients on uh, purchases and sales of business, you probably understand this concept, but we often, when we're ad talking with business owners that have never gone through a sale process, never gone through a valuation process, this concept can be a little foreign to them, and that is enterprise value or market value of invested capital. And that, and that basically is looking at the total value of the company and that being the market value of the equity and the balance sheet liabilities and really interest-bearing debt. Because um, a company that's funded with debt, the bank basically owns part of the company. And that needs to be considered in the overall capital structure. Um, and so in a transaction, I think John will probably get into this a little bit. Typically, what you're looking at is a um, if you're using a valuation approach, 
or transaction value, it's gonna be cash free, debt free. You keep your cash and uh, you assume liabilities if, um, it's an, if it's an asset sale. The, uh, so the approaches, the approaches to value are a little bit different on the next slide for M&A or going to market. Uh, the theoretical formal valuation, nobody really cares. They, they kind of hope they blow that out of the water by creating an auction situation. So, um, and I don't get my feelings hurt by that. It's okay. Uh, but, you know, you're going to go through this preliminary market valuation to try to determine what your bottom line might be. You're going to look for those strategic buyers and figure out what kind of synergies they might be able to bring to the table and hopefully price those in when evaluating what the company might be worth. And then, of course, the transaction value is ultimately what did you end up um, agreeing to at the end of the day. The, um, the next page has some standard definitions of value. And uh, I think the first one, fair market value, for those of you that, that are familiar, that is, um, that's defined by the Internal Revenue Service as a hypothetical willing buyer, willing seller, no compulsion to buy or sell. Both parties have all knowledge of relevant facts. So it's a hypothetical, really, financial buyer. And um, there's, a, so there's a really good case law in the United States Tax Court behind what you do and how you approach valuations in uh, gifting situations. And this is where, if you do have succession planning, if there's family in the business, you can really get some mileage out of going through a formal valuation process and getting into discounting down to fair market value, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, even if you're thinking about a transaction, this is a great way to take some money off the table, preserve it for the next generation before you gross it up for a strategic value. You, you, you can pass it on before that transaction happens. Um, some of the other investment value, that's the strategic value that we talked about. Our firm does a fair bit of ESOP valuation. We have uh, probably 70 recurring ESOP clients. Uh, probably every year we are looking to help advise on um, three to five brand new ESOP transactions. So we create a fairness opinion that the value is not more than um, appropriate, adequate consideration. That's one of the benchmarks. Uh, that is uh, required by the Department of Labor when valuing ESOP companies. The, uh, I think the next slide helps to understand maybe where uh, a valuation professional would um, help in the planning process uh, for gifting in particular. And if you, the top, the, at the top of the page, you, we start with strategic value. That's ultimately the highest price. You're hopefully going to have five to 10 different companies putting um, letters of intent in front of you that you can then uh, pick and choose the best offer from those. Uh, but someone that's trying to sell to their management team, someone that wants to gift to their um, kids, that's obviously not what they want to um, have the transaction value or likely don't want the transaction value to be. So through what we call minority interest and mar marketability discounts, we get to a much lower value off of a control valuation. And so we're starting with fair market value at control. All of those methods that we talked about earlier will pr produce a control marketable value. And um, that's not what we're giving away if it's a privately held company and it's say a 5% interest in a privately held company. And so we can take significant discounts that um, the IRS and the United States Tax Court is blessed. And on the next page, um, we go through some of, there are many, many studies that help support the discounts we take. As sort of a rule of thumb for those who are advising, um, for lack of control discounts, you could probably be anywhere from 5 to 25%, depending on the facts and circumstances of that interest you're giving. It's a pretty wide range. I think you, you probably typically see them between 10 and 20%. They tend to be a little bit lower than the marketability discounts. The marketability discounts, depending again on the company itself and the facts, uh, can be 10 to 45%. 
and what an appraiser will look to when judging the overall level of discounts really is that rate of return. So at the end of the day, if we take a 50% discount on a company and I'm consistently earning dividends at a rate, even if I'm a 5% shareholder, that suggests my rate of return is 60 or 70%, that's probably an asset that's been undervalued. And um, so that's one of the ways we look at the reasonableness of these discounts. Um, and there are many companies that don't provide any level of, of distributions, um, don't have the ability through their weak cash flow to do so, and those are the situations you can really see at the higher end of the range. Um, I'll touch real briefly on the next slide, which is retirement income needs. It goes without saying, if you're planning for the rest of your financial future and you're not going to be employed, you're not going to have the asset that's providing your main source of income, you really should do some retirement planning. And our, our suggestion is to get a professional involved if you don't already have one, an investment advisor, insurance advisor, to figure out and stress test your retirement needs. You know, what happens if you have a catastrophic loss of income? Do you still have enough to live off of if you decide to give away half of your estate in succession planning? Then, and once it's, it's gone, it's gone, unless you go begging to your kids or grandkids to get the money back. So you want to make sure that uh, you've done a thorough retirement income analysis prior to implementing any plan, sale to third party or gifting strategy. The last slide is, is probably um, the one that I think uh, highlights where valuation could be most useful to um, whether it be a, an advisor or a business owner thinking about what to do. There are some, and this is just, these are just a few strategies that can be employed uh, prior to um, either a sale to a third party or implementing a gift strategy. And as I said previously, gifting to uh, trusts and families, you know, Mario will probably have a, a lot of information on different strategies in, in gifting. Um, and even if you are thinking about selling to a third party, a strategic buyer, there are some unique opportunities to take advantage of to minimize estate taxes um, by setting up gifting well in advance. And the idea here is really start planning in the future because all of this takes time. You're going to have to draw up uh, legal documents, go through an appraisal process, and the further you get from a transaction event, the better for discounts and getting the lowest potential value. If you've already signed up John to sell your company and you have letters of intent, I probably can't get you too high of a discount on lack of marketability. You've already gone to market. Um, Something else that we see um, with clients, less and less of them are C corporations, but obviously with uh, the, the threat of taxation in a transaction at the corporate level in a C corporation, and then again at the shareholder level, if the assets are distributed out to shareholders, creates an extra complexity of taxation. We have been advising and have done several transactions of conversions of C corporations to S corporations when the business owner is thinking about selling, again, yes, you're going to lock in your built-in gain when you do that, but you're going to do it at a fair market value, uh, lower price than, than what you would be doing at um, going to market. So there's still some savings um, as opposed to just taking the entire hit on the gain should um, you know, a wonderful offer come from a strategic buyer. Um, the other thing that we help with and we see more and more as, as folks are looking to transition their businesses are um, creating buy-sell agreements and provisions for valuation and buy-sell agreements. We usually recommend that it have a fair market value um, provision and no that's not just self-serving. We really do think that is the appropriate way to go. We find that the formula values don't hold up well over time. They can and maybe that, that, that's um, something that serves the purpose. You just have to be really careful about how you set them up. Uh, the ones that we see that really don't hold up well are the ones that are based on the most recent year of income. And um, when uh, a company, like in 2008, we saw 2008 was a record year for folks, but by December they knew their business was not what it was. 
and we had lots of people exercising under management agreements um, to buy uh, under a formula value. And then the last item on the list there is, is ESOPs, which um, is basically a sale. You're making your own market. You're setting up a trust that can purchase the shares, and there are certain tax benefits to doing that. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm happy to take questions, but I think the idea is probably to take questions at the end.